Bible story time, okay? So the Tower of Babel, sometimes it's pronounced Babel. I think Babel is probably the better pronunciation because of babbling, and that works pretty well. When this story is told, there's a lot of babbling going on, plus the point of the story is really about babbling. So the Tower of Babel, or Tower of Babel, is told in Genesis 11, 1 through 9. Now, the fact is, the words Tower of Babel never actually appears, okay? Babel comes from Babylon, which is the town or the city in which, you know, this tower is allegedly have been built. So I'm going to tell you the story from the standard physical, you know, earthly interpretation, but then we're going to flip it into a spiritual interpretation, and you'll see it's an extremely relevant story for all of us. It's not just some interesting story from the old days, which most people think it tells the story of why we have so many different languages, why we speak French and Italian and Spanish and English and Swahili and all of that. I mean, that's the conventional way it's told. And it's actually told that it's, it's thought of, it's logical because it says language in the actual Genesis uh, 11. It says, it talks about confusing languages, okay? Ah, but language means something else, ways to communicate. And we're going to talk about exactly what that means. Starting with this, what language does God speak? Think of God or whatever God means to you, or even nature. What language does nature speak? If you have a dog, what does it speak? Does it understand English or just cues coming from you? What do horses speak? Do they just sort of feel your vibe? If there's a God, the way we think of that God, is it English? I mean, if you read the Bible, are you reading it in English because God speaks that? Well, of course not. Jesus spoke Aramaic. So certainly the words that he's being credited to saying in the Bible that, that are in English, it's not something he ever said because he didn't speak English. And the idea of thinking that God speaks in English is just silly, right? Does that mean he speaks French, Spanish, German? See, this helps us understand the point of the story because when we think of language as it comes to God, it's not the languages that we're speaking that I'm speaking right now. It's something else. It's actually pretty simple. The best way to think of language, the language of God, is just spirit. And the word of God is the energy or the resonance and the spirit in the concept. And what we, what we can do to each other is speak in English and French and German, but we can also speak in spirit to each other. Animals are pretty good at picking up on that, right? And we can do that with, e with each other as well. So I'm going to go through the Tower of Babel story, but keep that in mind. What language does God really speak? Okay. So, Genesis 11.1, 1. again, I just got the, the quick hitters from, from, from the most important uh, parts of this particular passage. It says in Genesis 11.1 Genesis 11, 1, that they speak, the people speak one language. I wonder what that was back then, Hebrew? I mean, what did they speak? And I'm quite confident that the people uh, over there in the Middle East weren't speaking the same language as the people that existed in Africa, right? Or up in Canada or wherever people were. So how do they know what language that was, okay? So, well, they say one language. And then the people migrated from the East. So we've drawn this idea many times for you, spiritual beings and physical beings. And I have all these little blobs that always represents your spirit, okay? Well, the people migrated from the East. It depends on which version you read. Some versions say from the East, some say to the East. I think it's pretty important. The King James Version says from the East. And the English Standard Version, which I read the most, says from the East. And I think that's important because the East side of your brain is the right side. And it's uh, on a map. When you're looking at the East, it's to the right. And it's a reference to the spiritual part of your head. And the left side, which is the west side, which is the um, f uh, logical side, is the more ego-physical related side. It's the, it's the side that, that doesn't think spiritually. Okay, And so they came from the east because we're spiritual beings coming into a physical world. So we're coming from the east, from the place of spirit. And throughout scripture, if you read references to being on the right side or the east, it's always a spiritual thing. Jesus said, cast the net to the right side of the boat. On the left, there was nothing. On the right, there was something. That's because that's the spiritual side of all, our, all of our brains. Jesus sat at the right hand of God, those types of things. Okay, That's because the right side and the east side is the spiritual side. So they came from the east and they took on a body. They migrated from the east. And when they got there... It's a reference to us as well. And we want to reach back towards God. They think, let's build a tower towards heaven. And what type of tower do they build? Well, a physical one, of course. We talked about this last week and the difference between a Christian and a Jesusian. Are you looking at this stuff physically or are you looking at it spiritually? And if you look at building a tower physically, well, here's a physical tower. And if you can think of the people in the day of this time and they're building a specific tower, they're building a physical tower. 
And if you try to build a physical tower, like somehow to impress God, you ain't never going to reach God with a physical tower. But that's what we do when we try to stack behavior on top of behavior on top of behavior to impress God. It ain't going to work. There's not a physical thing that you can do. There's not a physical uh, language either that's going to impress God because God doesn't speak physical languages. Okay? So it's a physical tower. In uh, Genesis 11:5, the Lord saw this tower and he saw that, and he said that they're one people, but he's recognizing these people are creative. They're clever. They're going to come up and they're going to do lots of different things. And they're going to try to do a whole lot of different stuff. And guess what? They're going to try to do physical things to impress me to try to get their way back to heaven. But you can't. Once you've become physical and you've taken on an ego, the only way back to spirit is to realize that your spirit, that's what awakening is. That's what it is to be born again, is to realize you're not the body. And you're not the ego that comes with the body. That's where all our arguing comes in. Because we, we're arguing over who's flesh and who's spirit and what is what and what is right. And so we argue a lot. Well, God or the Lord comes down and sees this and he decides, you know what? I'm not going to let this work. Because he's going he's gonna to smash the tower. They can't do it. So he comes down and destroys the tower. And the Lord confused their languages so that they don't understand each other. Okay? Let's talk about a couple terms before we finish this off. The region that these people went to, the region of the, of the world, was called Shinar. And Shinar has two different meanings. There might be more, but the two I found, I held on to right away. One is two rivers. That's what Shinar means, two rivers. Well, when you head from the east and you take on a body, guess what? You have two rivers too, two different ways of thinking. The rivers that flow through your head, again, water is a good uh, um, metaphor throughout scripture for mind in consciousness and then you end up developing when you take on a physical body a secondary river except for most of us we make it primary shinar means two rivers because they came from the one and they ended up in the two so now we're in the world of duality shinar two rivers but it also means watching over some someone who's sleeping remember what the word buddha means it means to wake up okay when jesus resurrected people it means he helped them wake up Wake up to what? Their true spiritual nature. So Shinar was a place where a bunch of people were sleeping. Why? Because as soon as you take on that second river, the physical river, the ego river, the I'm a boy or a girl or I'm a, a Republican or Democrat or black or white or whatever all those labels are, that's the secondary river, but we make it primary. And then we forget that we're spirit. We forget that we have a spirit body, that we're eternally spirit, that we came from the east into the west took on a physical body to have this experience for a bunch of different reasons. We'll talk about what that is much later. But uh, for, for this, in this context, once you get to the land of Shinar, you end up having a sleeping quality and a two mind quality. Well, the, uh, the builder of the Tower of Babel, uh, one of the leaders of the day, was na his name was Nimrod. There's a good chance you don't know too many people named Nimrod, okay? Now, Nimrod in Hebrew means rebel. And if you hear someone call someone else a Nimrod, you know it's probably not a compliment, okay? Well, Nimrod was a rebel because he was the building of the tower. Guess what we are, we spiritual beings, when we try to build a physical tower back to God? Well, we're Nimrods, okay? Because we're rebels. We're going against the spirit. We're going against the law. And the word works, okay? So don't be a Nimrod. And the, the tower it ends up be called, it ends up is called Babel, which literally means in, in Hebrew it's confusion. Okay? So what is the confusion? If we make it about language, that's actually sort of boring. Just about languages. I mean, I can tell you why people speak different languages. Because when the cavemen in Africa started to try to name things, and the cavemen in Canada started to name things, and the cavemen out in, in um, you know, the Eastern Hemisphere tried to name things, they had different sounds they started to make. So language formed from that. Dolphins make certain sounds, and chipmunks make certain sounds, and that's their language, okay? Duh! I don't need God to come down and do that. That's obvious why that happened. But God doesn't speak English or French or Russian or German or anything like that. God is the language of spirit, right? That's his language. And so how did we get confused? If you try to build physical towers back to God, the confusion comes in through religion, okay? Because that's the language of spirit. Attempting to explain spirit to each other through religion. That's the language we're talking about. How did we get separated? When you try to build a tower a physical structure somehow, your physical life and other people's physical lives, 
if we try to make it physical to find our spirituality again, we're going to end up arguing Christians and Jews and Muslims and Hindus and Buddhists and atheists and everything. We're going to have people arguing about what's right or wrong. Because we're confused now. We've confused each other. And what we don't realize is God is speaking the same language to all these people. He's just not using French, English, and Spanish. And each of these religions describes the same thing differently. Right? And there's fundamental tenets, as we'll do in a second, in each of them, which demonstrate this. We'll do a very important one in a, in a second. So, the city is called Babel because we are all confused and we are a bunch of spiritual beings who took on these physical bodies. And in order to unify back as spiritual beings, we got to figure out we're not physical. And we have to stop arguing with each other about the physical stuff. Who's got the nicest church or the best prophet and all that physical stuff. And you need to do this or that in order to get your way back to God. As we go through the you know Bible studies that we're going to do, you're going to see Jesus doesn't uh, doesn't worry about that stuff almost at all. He only talks about the spiritual language, and don't worry about a speck in a neighbor's eye when you have a log in your own, right? And figure out that the language of God is the Spirit, and it speaks directly to your heart. So here I'll give you an example of this and how language is really religion, and yet it's saying the same thing. The Spirit brings it all together in a unifying way is there's a concept in a, we've done this before in this group, but it's perfect for this. There's a concept in, in all the various religions that's the same, but it seems different. In Buddhism, it's called Dzogchen, which is the great perfection. It must be experienced. I've actually drawn it on the board because we're spiritual beings having a physical experience. We get confused by the ego. And then we have to wake up to the true nature of reality and realize our essence. And once you do that, you're awakened and that's the great perfection. In uh, Islam, it's Esau, which is to live as if Allah is in the room with you, because he is, and it's not a he either. It's a spirit that's present right now. And if you have the awareness that your spirit or this spirit's present in you right now, you're good. And it's in, in, in Islam, it's called perfection, Esau. In Hinduism, Siddhi is the recognition that the, the, the great perfection was placed inside you at birth, that you already have it. You couldn't lose your spirit. We lose your spirit when you when you think you're the flesh. Now you identify with the flesh, and now you've lost your spirit. Well, just realizing that is to realize CD, which is the great perfection within. Perfection, perfection, perfection. Matthew 5, 48, Jesus says, be perfect. Right? Well, that's interesting. I thought he says you could screw up all the time, and as long as you believe that he walked on water and his mother is a virgin, you get to go to heaven. No, no, he says be perfect. Well, good luck being physically perfect. You're not going to be able to build a tower of physical perfection. Well, guess what perfection is? Realizing that you're already a perfectly divine spiritual being. The same thing the Hindus were saying. Were saying. You're born with it. The awareness that the, that the God essence is already within you. That's the great perfection where Jesus says the kingdom of heaven is found. is inside you. The Tao, one of the oldest philosophies, verse 29 says, we are vessels of perfection. Now, that's nice to know. We're a vessel, physical vessel, with spiritual perfection inside. That's what we're, we're here to have that experience, which is Zogchen. Notice how these are all different religions saying the same thing. The spirit can unify. The spirit is the language of God. And if you look at all religions and all philosophies from that perspective, it'll all be one. It'll be one people, one language, really one religion. And the word religion means to reconnect. To what? To the, the spiritual presence inside of each one of us. Tao verse 41 says perfection has no shape. What a, what a nice little uh, teaching there. Perfection has no shape because it ain't this. And it's not this. And I drew a shape just because we're humans you know, trying to explain this stuff. But spirit doesn't have a shape. What a weird way to describe that. Okay, but it's an essence. And so perfection isn't talking about all the, the ways we're supposed to manage our physical world to make sure that we're physically perfect. We're, we're perfectly screwed up. We make perfect mistakes all the time. And just the recognition of that is the perfection. So we'll end with this, and then we'll tease future uh, lectures. Uh, Psalm 19.7, the law of the Lord is perfect. It will restore your soul. Okay, so we started with this idea. You have spiritual beings coming from the east, taking on a physical body. Before you were here, you were a spiritual being. After you're here, you'll be a spiritual being. While you're here, you're a spiritual being. But you forgot it. All of us do. To wake up to that truth is to remember, I was spirit then, I'm spirit now, I'll be spirit later. What I'm not is this flesh thing. And that's the stuff we argue about. 
So the laws of the Lord are perfect. It'll restore your soul. What does that mean? The very Lord that came down to smash this into bits is like, uh, you're going to speak the only language that you need to speak in its spirit. And what are those laws? Well, love another as oneself. Love God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. Love your enemies, right? Uh, rejoice in your suffering, says Paul. Consider it a joy when you face adversities of all kinds, says James, right? Forgive people. Be patient, kind, compassionate, and wise. And don't worry about specks in other people's eyes when you have a log in your own, okay? Is that what Americans are doing? Not, not my experience, okay? When I've done this wrong, and I've done it wrong plenty, and I'll do it wrong later today, I feel it. I feel smacked down by some force. Because, you know what? This body is a perfect... Um, it's a perfectly set up, finely tuned for this. Because when I judge, I can feel it. And when I'm fearful, I can feel it. And when I'm impatient, I can feel it. Well, the laws of the Lord are perfect. Whenever you love another as yourself, and whenever we stop judging each other, when we see each other as the light, like it says in Course in Miracles, the only way we can help each other is to only see the light, light in each other. That's namaste. And that's recognizing, oh, I get it. We all started at this place. We all took on a body. We all forgot who we were. First noble truth, we're going to suffer now. The second noble truth, we suffer because of our attachments to what? Physical stuff, right? In our opinions, our relative opinions. I was born here, you were born there. You were taught this, I was taught that. Well, my, my way is right, okay? Well, you're not going to get back to God looking, thinking like that. But the third noble truth, detached, when I'm able to let go of that opinion... Hindus actually have that direct teaching. You want to access truth? Give up all your opinions. Your opinions are conditioned anyways. So give up your opinions. Stop identifying or over-identifying with the label of the body. And then you're going to speak the language of spirit. As such, the laws of the Lord are perfect. Everybody's on this journey. Different stages of development, just like every plant and you know every flower in the world some flowers have bloomed and others will bloom next week and some bloom last week but none of them are better than anyone else all of us are are actually blooming together different rates so it comes down to this babble does work because when we talk about other things non-spiritual things uh, we're going to get into arguments and who's right and who's wrong and who you should kill in the name of your prophet okay right who do you think is going to hell because you don't need to worry about that Karma will take care of all of that. The world knows what it's doing with all of us, okay? Rest assured, whatever experience you're having, when you work on this, when you work on your spiritual process by trying to speak the same language, the language of spirit, well, that's your destiny. That's actually all of our destiny. But when we do it individually, ah, that's when the peace comes to us.